Ashley, it's amazing. You know, you start reading these transcripts, digging into the details, and it becomes uh, more and more uh, bizarre, to say the least. Yeah, not just a secret husband, which, by the way, blew just about everybody away. If you could get on the phone line, there were only 200 phone lines, and everybody around the world, uh, you know, was trying to report on this. So that went under the radar for a lot of people. There was a little bit of audio dropout, too, as I understand it. So that detail kind of slipped for a lot of people. But Vinny, it's not just that detail. It's that whole other little footnote as well that came in that um, bail hearing. Uh, the fact that the FBI apparently has more people that have come out of the woodwork since Elaine Maxwell's arrest. Do you remember, Vinny? Um, gosh, it just seems so long ago, but it was only July 2nd that the FBI held that news conference after her arrest that day. And uh, you know, the FBI will often do this. We've got pictures of it. I want, I want to show you. They, they put up a big sandwich board, like a poster in the front of, um, of their, you know, press conference. And they point to pictures and they point to like bullet points in their case. And in this particular case, they pointed to a picture of Jeffrey Epstein and Elaine Maxwell. And at the very bottom of that poster, um, as is usually the case, there was like 1-800-CALL-FBI if you might be a part of this, if you think you might have been abused by one or both of these people, like 1-800-CALL-FBI. And guess what happened? Apparently, some people did 1-800-FBI because during that bail hearing, I want to read for you what the prosecutors actually said about the publicity that was generated that day from the arrest. Okay, ready? Prosecutor said, additionally, and beyond the strong evidence set forth in the indictment, in just the past week, and in response to the charges against the defendant being made public, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, better known as the FBI, and the U.S. Attorney's Office have been in touch with additional individuals who've expressed a willingness to provide information regarding the defendant. The government is in the process of receiving and reviewing this additional evidence, which has the potential to make the government's case even stronger. Um, what? I mean, that's pretty jaw-dropping. All of a sudden, they've got enough material to arrest Elaine Maxwell. They bring her in. They put up the 1-800, call us if you, you think you might have had a problem with these two. And shazam, we now know they have more people, they have more evidence, and they're in the process of reviewing. All fascinating. But there's even more that's fascinating about this case. I had the opportunity to speak with a woman named Laura Goldman, who is a family friend of the Maxwell family. She knows all the members of the family intimately. Uh, there were eight children. One died. There are still three sisters and three brothers of Ghislaine Maxwell. She's the youngest, right? Ghislaine is the youngest. So she's got all these older siblings who are firmly standing behind their little sister, their 58-year-old little sister. But uh, what was interesting was talking to Laura Goldman about a, a couple of things, not only the family support, um, but also this mystery husband. And even more importantly, what on earth has Ghislaine Maxwell been doing while secreting away in hiding for the year? I asked her all of those questions. Have a listen. What was your reaction uh, when we learned this week that Ghislaine Maxwell has a secret husband? I wasn't surprised at all. I had been uh, telling people that she was traveling with a man uh, during her year in hiding. And I figured any man that was willing to spend a year in hiding with uh, the most uh, hated woman in America had to be very, very serious about her. What was she doing um, for that whole year? Like, what, how would she spend her days? What was she doing? She spent a lot of time talking to her family. She's always been very close to her family. Um, she didn't really call a whole lot of other people because she didn't want them hurt by association with her. She exercised a lot. Um, you know, and, and she read an, an enormous amount of books. And she's always read a lot of books. But at the same time, in your communications with her, you learned that while she has always been very um, conscious of her weight and would never eat so much as an Oreo cookie, that changed in hiding. Yeah, she's this, uh, food became her comfort. And um, she had a lot of anxiety. And, uh, you know, I knew she was uh, very anxious when she told me she ate an Oreo. Then I knew she was very nervous. Did she put on a lot of weight over the course of the year? I'd say about 20 pounds or so. Which would be a lot for her. Right, right. What did she communicate to you regarding her anxiety uh, while she was in hiding? 
she didn't know what the the best path forward was. You know, on one hand, uh, it is true uh, that her lawyers were in touch with the police or, or the FBI, but it seemed like uh, they wanted to make an arrest. They did not want her to surrender. Did she think at any point that uh, an arrest was imminent? Yeah. Well, at last time I talked to her, which is about a month ago, uh, she felt that it was, you know, it was coming to the end. You know, maybe she knew that the police had just missed her at her last location. Tell me about uh, Ghislaine's family and her sisters who've been supportive. Um, what did they tell you about this whole process? I, I am like amazed at how well they've handled this. I am in no way saying they're a major victim of this case. The real victims are the underage girls, but the family, you know, is, has been tarred, you know, or it, it, with in some ways the same brush as Ghislaine, even though I'm pretty sure they had nothing to do with any part of it. The Maxwell family has weathered many scandals and they have, are incredibly close. Her two sisters stand beside her, they're in America, and they had already agreed to um, sign a bond for her. And they were two of another, I think, total six people who were prepared to um, undersign the, the bail? Yes, there were six people and she did not reveal them in court yet um, because, um, because of the notoriety. She's hoping that at some point there can be some gag order on the case and people can come forward and say, yes, I will sign a bond for her, but they don't want to be um, you know, persecuted in the press for you know, for helping their friend in their in her dark hour. Any idea why she can't just post her own bond? I mean, the rumors and even the FBI reports have her upwards of twenty million dollars uh, in assets. Well, apparently, the government feels that if you have your friends sign your bond and your family, that you're less likely to run. So therefore, they like to have. That's something that they enjoy or prefer in a bail package. Did the, um, the group of six who were prepared to underwrite the bail, did that include this mystery husband? No, which was surprising, but it might have to do with, she, she you know, um, she wanted to protect him. Her two sisters were, were uh, part of the group. When she was communicating with you, um, I think you mentioned she was trying to put it out there that she was somewhere other than where she was. Can you explain that? Well, I think she felt that, you know, she was very worried about her safety. No matter what everyone said, she was she received vile death threats. People around her received vile death threats. You know, and you know, I guess she wanted to widen the area that she was in. You know, that people were looking for her. Was it only so, for the death threats, or was it also so that investigators would be sort of thrown off her scent? I don't think so, because I think she thought in the end she was going to voluntarily surrender. You know, the British system, which is what she was raised in, is a little more civil uh, than ours in terms of that kind of stuff. And I don't think, I think she really actually thought that they would call her and tell her she had to come in. It's hard to wrap your head around what the relationship was between Glenn Maxwell and, and Jeffrey Epstein. Some say former girlfriend, others say fixer. What exactly were they? Well, in the beginning, he was the love of her life. She thought she was going to marry him. And I guess at some point when she was out, you know, allegedly recruiting young girls for him, she realized that, um, you know, this might not be the love of her life, but she still thought they would get married. She thought he was the king, you know, that they were going to be the king and queen of New York society. Um, she, she couldn't accept for the longest time that he wouldn't marry her. Ghislaine Maxwell tried several times to separate herself from Jeffrey, and she just wasn't successful at it. Um, you know, she had founded a real estate venture and tried to, um, you know, uh, convince him that she was going to leave and he would lure her back. You couldn't really leave Jeffrey Epstein, you know, and I think people don't realize that. And I, I try, I've tried to say you can be both predator and victim. And sometimes being a victim turns you into a predator. Fascinating um, conversation with Laura Goldman. And one of the other aspects that I think if you blink, you missed it there. But she said that there's likely going to be an appeal. 
uh, launched against this bail ruling in which she thinks that Gill and Maxwell's attorneys will request that there's a gag order or at least there's something sealed. Uh, the concern here, according to Laura Goldman's thinking, is that, you know, it's really hard if you want to help Elaine Maxwell. She's, as Laura said, one of the most hated women in America. And so if you're on the list of helping to bail her out, you could be subject to sort of the legions of uh, those online who might harass you or your, 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 you know, safety could be at risk. So that, that might be the argument um, if that, in fact, is the way they're going, uh, Vinny. But also, I think what's super fascinating in this case, and we need to really watch this carefully, as it moves forward, I think you're going to see there were little there were little nuggets of suggestions in this bail hearing that the southern uh, that, that the, um, the the U.S. attorney in Florida who had arranged that sweetheart deal for Jeffrey Epstein years ago um, said that he, you know he had immunity from further prosecution in those respects and did the unindicted co-conspirator. I think they're going to argue that up here. There's already been an argument put forth in the documents, in the transcripts that we were reading through today. And that is that, no, no, that doesn't cover this district up here in, in New York. That only covers that district down there in Florida. So I think, you know, pop your popcorn and, and prepare to see that argument. And maybe you would know better, Vinny, but um, they're going to fight valiantly that she's covered by that non-prosecution agreement that was part of that deal that I don't know how Jeffrey Epstein got it with a 50-odd page indictment against him. Um, somehow he just got, you know, a couple of months of nighttime jail and uh, called it a day. And apparently so do the co-conspirators. Yeah, and be a fascinating issue. And that might be, uh, you might have a better chance on that issue than if you get in front of a jury and the facts of the case are laid out there. But of course, we'll continue to cover it. Ashley Banfield, thank you so much. You're welcome.